Hello, hello everybody. Um, so um, I'm Irina Pert and I would like to start this um, uh, seminar uh, understanding uh, Sabornost um, that um, we have been running now for more than a year uh, at the University of Tartu uh, School of Theology and Religious Studies and this is part of a research project uh, um, Orthodoxy as Solidarity and Examination of Popular and Conciliar Orthodoxy in the Baltic Provinces and Estonia, funded by Estonian Research Council. So today we have um, uh, also um, our students here. So this is a part of special seminar in Orthodox Church history. And uh, our guest today is Aristotle Papa Nikolaou, who will be introduced by um, the member of the project, uh, Andrei Shishkov. So Andrei, uh, please uh, introduce our guest. Yes, thank you, Irina. Uh, and I am glad to introduce our guest, uh, Dr. Uh, Aristotle Papa Nikolaou, Professor uh, Archbishop Demetrius Chair in uh, Orthodox Theology and Culture and co-founding director of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at the Fordham University, New York. Uh, Aristotle is a leading uh, Orthodox uh, political theologian, the author of the book Mystical as Political, and uh, also a co leader of the project Orthodoxy and uh, Human Rights, funded by the Lewis uh, Foundation and Leadership uh, 100. Uh, it is a great pleasure uh, to see uh, Telly here uh, in our seminar and great opportunity for our students to hear one of the best uh, Orthodox theologians right now. Uh, today, uh, our seminar will have a slightly different format uh, than the um, previous ones. Uh, we have agreed with uh, Telly that uh, this will, will not be his presentation, but rather an interview or Q&A ses session. Uh, and uh, in the first part, uh, Irina and I uh, will ask uh, Aristotle questions and uh, in the second part all the participants of the seminar will be able to do so. We also received some questions uh, by email from the students and they uh, will be able to ask them uh, in the second half. Uh, we would like uh, to discuss uh, today uh, three topics uh, with Telly. First one uh, is ecclesiology. Uh, theoretical models of uh, church structure and the current crisis in the orthodox uh, inter-orthodox relations and uh, we will talk about uh, ch uh, church uh, synodality conciliarity uh, so on the main topic of our seminar uh, <clears throat> the second one is social theology uh, aristotle is one of the authors uh, of the for the life of the world document uh, adopted uh, by uh, by the greek arch archdiocese uh, in america uh, a very good example of the orthodox social um, uh, theology uh, we will talk about uh, what place uh, the concept of synodality conciliarity or subordinate might have in formulating the social ethos uh, of the orthodox church and the third one, I think uh, very important today, uh, the topic of uh, reconciliation. Uh, we will talk uh, about it. Um, uh, Telly uh, brilliantly laid out this topic in his book, uh, The Mystical as Political. Uh, and uh, we uh, would like to discuss uh, how the current uh, war in Ukraine is uh, problematizing uh, this uh, topic. Um, okay, uh, let's let's go. And uh, I would like to ask uh, the first uh, question uh, with a short introduction for uh, for those uh, people who um, uh, doesn't know um, uh, the material well. Uh, uh, Telly, in your article uh, published in uh, 2016, you described uh, a model of, uh, of the structure of the church based uh, on the ecclesiology of Metropolitan John Zizioulas. And uh, his model uh, has three levels of ecclesial structure, uh, diocese, local church, and universal church. And uh, in the diocese, the bishop is a corporate person of his community through participation in the Eucharist. People are united with him into one body. 
in which the bishop becomes uh, the head at the level of the local church, uh, which unites the various dioceses, the bishops gather uh, in a council and the council has a chairman or presider who is the first bishop of honor uh, in that local church. And in your, uh, uh, in your paper, uh, you go further and propose the same scheme uh, for the pan-Orthodox level uh, and the council for the whole church becomes the council of primates of the local churches. It is headed by the first among inquels uh, in honor, the ecumenical patriarch. Uh, this model in practice uh, is very similar to the synexes of primates that uh, Patriarch Bar Bartholomew created in the 19th and which was um, uh, instrumental in preparing uh, the Holy and Greek Council of the Orthodox Church. Uh, you wrote this uh, article before the council uh, took place in Crete in uh, 2016, and there are slightly different patterns of uh, participation, uh, but broadly similar uh, in it. Uh, the local churches were represented by delegations of local churches uh, and uh, had a single voice. Uh, this council was uh, partially successful in terms of a format. Uh, the four uh, autocephalous churches did not participate, uh, which put its uh, unorthodox uh, status in, in these uh, churches into question. And my question is uh, how your theoretical uh, views on the structure of the church changed from, from 2016 and can the model described earlier uh, be an effective way to govern the church, especially in the context of the current uh, crisis in uh, inter-Orthodox relations, when, uh, when Ru the Russian church has broken off uh, Eucharistic communion with a number of Greek churches and opened parallel jurisdiction in Africa? Yeah, it's a good question. Um... First of all, let me say thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm following the work of the center there and some of the webinars, and uh, I think they're really great. And so, um, especially this uh, kind of continued conversation elaboration of Sobornos, which really was, <clears throat> I mean, I, I mean uh, there's all kinds of ways of seeing this, but in the 19th century, Russia, you could see a kind of, um, I, I interpret that, um, movement of theology and religious ideas as a kind of revival of orthodox theology and the very concept of Sobonos was sort of central uh, to that uh, revival and it, it continues really to this day. Um, and the uh, concept of Sobonos um, uh, to some extent really focused our attention on the theological question of the church. What is the church? Where is the church? So when discussing the church, um, so a couple of things. One is we're going to talk about political theology today eventually. So just let me say this right away. I mean, I mean, I think the, the question of political theology uh, is a question of, of the church. It's a question of necessarily of the church that the church has to consider. It's a question of um, thinking about what is the church and where is the church and how should the church relate? And um, in, in Thinking about that question, of course, it also is a question about individual Christians um, who are part of the church, who, as I'll talk in just a few seconds, uh, in the Eucharist Assembly are the church. Um, so so the, the, the theological question of the church um, is one that's crucial to many of the questions we're going to address today. And it is probably the case that in the fathers of the church, I mean, there is no such word as ecclesiology, right? That we don't find that anywhere. But to say that they didn't really think about the church, I think was, would be a mistake. Because um, uh, uh, clearly they, there is thinking about um, what is church, where is church, even if we don't have the word ecclesiology. So Sobornus helps focus that, and I think it helps focus on the Eucharist and we have this word, a Eucharistic ecclesiology, and of course that was the name of the fathers either, and many people now are sort of pushing back against this word. Um, you know, we don't have to use that word, we don't have to use that phrase, uh, but uh, if we're going to ask ourselves the question, like, what is the church, where is the church? I, I, I've really thought about this, I really can't think of um, 
anywhere else to point than than the Eucharist. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I said this in, in uh, some other one of, one of the other writings that when you maybe it's the same one that you mentioned, Andre, that it, when you ask the question, where is Christ? And when we point to Jesus, that's why there are canons that we don't allow. Um, I'm sorry, where is God? Uh, we point to Jesus Christ. Um, that's why we don't allow depictions of, you know, uh, old uh, the father as an old man and in our icon in our iconography. I know that exists, but we don't really allow it. And there's a good theological reason for that. Because the visibility of God, of course, is Christ. So we have to have some form of visibility for the church. Um, and uh, I, I just think that it's correct. I mean, we can call it this Julian, but it really was Komakovian, right? Where there, there is a sense in which the church, uh, the, the, the church is the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is the Eucharistic assembly uh, come together to worship with a presider there. There's something about that that, to me, theologically makes a lot of sense. So um, once we establish that point, uh, then I think we have to think about institutional structures. And institutional structures have somehow have to have some consistency with what we're kind of identifying theologically as the church. Um, but the institutional structures are flexible. Uh, they're, uh, they're much more um, malleable, as we say. Um, they don't have to have, take hard and fast forms. But they, to, to some extent, have to reflect the communion that is gifted in the Eucharist, right? And I do realize sometimes that in the Eucharist, it doesn't feel like the kingdom of God. It doesn't feel like Sobornos. It doesn't feel, but maybe that's our problem. In other words, that is what is being offered to us um, through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And perhaps it takes us some ascetical work on our part to realize that this is actually what is present, right? So then we have to think about institutional structures. And, and again, I've said this in some writings too, in the pushback against you know, the word Eucharistic ecclesiology, we, we forget that the phrase itself, the, the theological idea, the articulation of it um, was against more institutional and pyramidal structures of the church, identifying the church with these institutional structures. And I, and personally, I think that was a correct move, right? The church is a sacramental and eschatological reality. It's not the institution, God forbid, if it's the institutions, especially given what we're seeing today. Um, so, you know, I think that the institutional structures uh, of synodality, quite remarkably, in my opinion, are, very consistent with um, understanding the presencing of the church, the cosmic eschatological reality of the church in the Eucharistic assembly. There's something about that structure, ironically, that is very democratic, that is potentially very communal, um, but uh, because it's an institutional reality, it's obviously not perfect, doesn't run well. There are a lot of holes in it. There's a lot of, um, it's not simply the Pan-Orthodox Council of 2016 that sort of uh, manifested some of those problems. There have always been problems. Uh, and um, some of the problems are the fact that uh, the synodality is pretty much controlled by men, quite honestly, um, bishops. And if there's a real communion, there has to be ways of thinking about synodality that has much more inclusive structures. You, you hear, I remember Archbishop of Athens, the former Archbishop of Athens, Christodoulos, well, may his memory be eternal, him saying once, because I'm going to criticize him now, but he, he said once, uh, well, you know, if the people don't uh, trust that the Holy Spirit guides the bishops, then, you know, that's their problem or something like that. And I mean, that's just a bad use of um, the theology of the Holy Spirit. I mean, institutional structures are flawed. They make mistakes. Um, we can only approximate, to some extent, the kind of communion that is gifted in the Eucharist. And we have to constantly work towards uh, correcting those structures in order to facilitate uh, communion. And so 
I think the Pan-Orthodox Council of 2016 was not a total failure. I think it was a good idea. I think uh, the fact that uh, most of the churches would get together, I think it's you know something you have to start somewhere, but it's simply a beginning, in my opinion, because again, uh, even before this council, the way in which we think about these synodal structures are themselves flawed, right? I mean, first of all, again, uh, the representation is not what it should be. You know, I also, I compared it once that it, it feels, because it's just all these men and all these the, the bishops, it feels like uh, sort of the House of Lords with the House of Commons. And so it doesn't quite reflect the communion uh, in that sense. Um, I think that the, the, um, the fact that autocephalous churches are for the most part, uh, are for the most part structured around national borders, um, creates a problem in synodality, right? Because we're having a problem in terms of a more global pan-Orthodox um, um, convening. Uh, uh, so we don't have these kinds of structures because we used to rely on the imperial structures and now we don't have those. Um, I think today the situation in Ukraine is revealing even more uh, the necessity for a kind of primacy that has a certain amount of power, not the kind of power that the Pope claims for himself today, not that kind of primacy, but we need some kind of transnational focal point. Uh, you know, Father Meyendorf, John Meyendorf had a great idea that perhaps the, the Synod in Constantinople could reconfigure it along the lines of a certain kind of pan-Orthodoxy. In other words, members on the Synod could be representatives from the various autocephalous churches. I mean, these are just ideas that we need to think about in order to have what's called the transnational focus so that we can somehow uh, have orthodoxy move beyond our kind of national identities and our national boundaries. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, these are just, and, and then again, just greater representation and so on and so forth. So I just, I guess the quick answer to your question is synodality in general, in my opinion, still reflects um, most consistently the institutional structures that should emerge from uh, the Eucharistic uh, the, 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 the church as, you know, the Eucharist assembly. But we, we, knew, we need a lot of work to continue to kind of think about those structures in ways that reflect the kind of communion that is gifted to us within the Eucharist. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I would like to clarify uh, uh, the current uh, theological models in the Orthodox Church, including uh, Zulus' uh, model, uh, they are very uh, episcopal centric. Is there a place uh, for the laity in church government, for the laity and, should, and mm -hmm. for women, for example? And how uh, should they be represented in the yeah. in this uh, synodal uh, synodal body? How do you see their participation? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. That's also a good question. I don't know, quite honestly. I think right now the synodal structure is such where it's kind of different, I think, within all the churches. So for the Church of Greece, for example, has rotating bishops on a particular synod. Um, I think the, the Patriarchate of Serbia has, uh, I'm not sure exactly their system, but they have a, an, an all bishop sort of synod, I think every two, every, twice every year, maybe once a year. Um, so there are ways of thinking and tweaking that. Um, but uh, one, you know, easy particular one answer in particular could be that you know, prior to this, you know, prior to synodal kinds of um, uh, meetings and decisions, um, that there are uh, you know committees that, on which you know lay people should and can serve, including women, that ultimately can inform the decisions. Another, uh, this is a little more radical. Excuse me. I mean, another one could simply be that that as part of the decision making process, it's not simply in the hands of just simply the governing hierarchs, especially since the hierarchs themselves are all men. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there are different. I mean, I, there's no look. Let me put it this way. There's absolutely no theological reason for one exact particular institutional structure. The only thing that theology can do is point us to the Eucharist and, and point us to the fact that that's where the church is. Now, from there, I think what we have to do is simply be within our institutional structures, have to be consistent 
with that vision of the church. We have to provide structures that are consistent. Now, th that could be done a lot of ways, but I mean, so it, one way that it's not done is if one bishop within one autocephalous church functions as some kind of monarch. That's that's not that's that's a, that's an example of a wrong way of doing it, right? And I guess what I'm kind of saying is that the current structure that we have in some ways does reflect what's given to us in the Eucharist is consistent with, and in many ways doesn't. Um, so there are you know, ways in which we can you know, rethink those structures in ways I think that reflect a little bit more the, the, what we're kind of saying within our, our, our theological understandings of the Eucharist and the church. So, and uh, there can be many ways in which we can think about that. But there's no one, there's no one theologic, theologically cannot, theology can't dictate exactly the institutional form, right? Just like theology cannot dictate exactly the borders of an autocephalous church. It can't do that. But um, it can provide at least uh, the, the guideposts uh, for thinking about how the institutional structure should be formed. Yes, thank you. It's very interesting idea of multi-structural uh, church. Uh, and uh, we, we can uh, return uh, to, to it uh, in the further discussion. Uh, and, but I uh, would like to ask uh, um, another question which connected with uh, social theology. Uh, when I read uh, the document for the life of the world, uh, I uh, don't find in it uh, any notions of synodality, conciliarity, or subordinates. Uh, um, Meanwhile, the notion of subordinates, for example, uh, was a very um, important part, uh, not only of ecclesiology, but also of uh, social theology of Slavophiles. And, and the question is, uh, does this mean that for uh, social uh, theology, this concept is not a, a applicable? Uh, can we say that synodality, conciliarity, or subordinacy are purely uh, ecclesiological one, or uh, do any uh, of these concepts uh, still have uh, the potential for uh, social theology? If so, how much? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I argue in my book that um, Again, that the, the church, uh, what we say about, you know, what is happening, let's say, and this, this is where I think Zizulis is correct. In other words, that the Eucharist is an event, right? I mean, um, um, and again, it, sometimes it doesn't feel that way, right? We go into a Eucharist and uh, sort of, we, you know, we, do, we don't necessarily feel like this is the eschaton, but whether we do or not, um, it, that is what's being gifted to us. Right. That is what's that is what's being gifted to us. And and so it is it is an event of communion. I, I personally I, this is where is your list, I think, is, is lacking a bit in the sense that I, I do think that we still have to um, we have to engage ascetically even prior and in the Eucharist in order for us to realize and to and to actually experience this event that's happening. Right. So the ascetical is not something you do outside of the Eucharist. It's actually something which can uh, make possible a, a particular way of experiencing the Eucharist, uh, experiencing it as the event that it is. So in that sense, the church really does, the church, um, uh, the theology of the church as communion does function as a kind of, um, you know, it, it functions as a way for us to see how people should relate to each other, how people should be in relationship to each other. Yeah, okay. Now, what I've argued, what I've, yeah, let me just finish my thought, because what I've argued is that that's not irrelevant towards how the Christians should see their uh, participation in politics, that there could be a kind of political communion. Obviously, it's not the same as the Eucharistic communion, but I do think that we can, you know, we can see, uh, you know, what's happening, what's possible, let's say, within political relationships. Now, political relations, I'm using very broadly, I'm not using in the sense of just, you know, government people acting with each other, but more broadly, 
I do think that it's possible for us to see patterns of relationship that uh, iconically sort of um, make present to a greater or lesser degree the kind of communion that is realized within the church. So I, I've argued that, and I still believe that. And I you know, so totalitarianisms, authoritarianisms, these do not facilitate those kinds of patterns of relationship, in my opinion. So, so in that sense, I think, I think the social ethos document, it's not meant to be an ecclesiological document. Maybe that's one of the weaknesses. Maybe it needed to lay out a certain kind of ecclesiology. But I do think um, I do think it tries to share a vision of political and social involvement that is trying to facilitate patterns of relationship that one can call godly, that aren't godly in the same sense or same presencing as what we experience in the Eucharist. But I, I just have to believe that, you know, God wants people who don't believe the same thing to relate to each other in, in, in there are better ways in which they can relate to each other than other ways. And government structures play a role in facilitating those particular patterns of relationship. Uh, can we say that uh, communion uh, could be uh, such a, a kind of uh, translation from ecclesiology, uh, of uh, synodality from ecclesiology to social theology? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think it's a word that's applicable across, but I just, I think we have to see it in terms of, again, sort of greater or lesser degrees. I mean, to, I, I mean again, the, the, the underlying structure of it all is the sacramental view of materiality. And that materiality, I think, has to even do with uh, political structures, right? There is, a, there is a certain kind of materiality there, right? Um, and so anything that, in some sense, any way, the ways in which material realities are dealt with, are structured, are, are, are exchanged, are, you know, lived, related to, I mean, that's, that's, sacramentality is, is potentially possible there. Um, to some extent, uh, we should, we don't have to go into this now, but I mean, this could be, to some extent, this could uh, somewhat related to Maximus's idea of logi, and I think here Stanaloy is very good because he talks about how, uh, to some extent, the way in which the logi are manifested depends on how we dialogue and relate with them. So there's a certain way of applying that to how we think about material structures and how we relate to them. And I mean, that's the great gift of the incarnation that God God is presenced in and through these material structures and forms. And I just think that some structures. Are, are kind of the anti-theosis, are the anti-presencing. You know, they, 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 you know, for example, the, you know, uh, the concentration camps uh, during World War II, I mean, you don't, there's no presencing there. There's no, the structures are not designed in such a way as to do that. I mean, I'm not going to say that God is totally absent, um, but, um, but the, the structures aren't designed in that way to make God present, right? And I just think that we have to think about politics and political structures in the same way. Politics is not the kingdom of God, it's not eschatological, but to say that somehow it's completely kind of on the other side and has nothing to do with God or salvation, to some extent, as might be indicated within, you know, perhaps Lutheran forms of political theology, I might be overgeneralizing here, but I, I think is wrong. Uh, I just, that doesn't make any sense to me. And uh, it, it, it follows us uh, to, to the third uh, question uh, of uh, indirectly connected with, uh, with the notion of conciliarity, maybe uh, reconciliation. And I would like uh, Irina to join uh, our conversation and uh, to ask you uh, the question. Uh, uh, thank you, Andrei. Um, so um, your... Um, uh, idea, your your uh, thesis on uh, on this kind of sacramental um, approach to um, social and political theology uh, is uh, uh, kind of your move from from Eucharist to to pen uh, uh, penance in 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 uh, the last chapter of your, of your book, mystical as as political and uh, and the this. Um, uh, like your reading of um, of the sacrament of penance as, as this 
um, you know, truth telling uh, and, and, and relationship uh, between the truth teller and, uh, and the, you know, witness. Uh, I think it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I found this, uh, you know, uh, very original. And I, I, I mean, I've heard you before about this, but I think this uh, way of looking at um, um, the sacrament and the theology of, of, of penance is, is absolutely, um, well, in, in, my, in my view, enlightening on, on many um, aspects. And But then, you know, when you speak about um, um, uh, the level of, 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 of um, society, yes, so you you start from you start with truth and reconciliation commission in south africa and then you know you 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 kind of return to to this problem at the end and then uh, surprisingly you know what 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 you do you just say that actually it's not possible to have the same uh, kind of uh, relationship the same kind of communion between the wrongdoer and the victim in the political community. So if I understood you correctly, because, mm -hmm. you know, even if these communities are represented by the symbolic actors like presidents, you know, the whatever, the patriarchs or, or, or the Pope, you know, it's still not the same as the uh, true communion between the victim uh, and the wrongdoer. But actually the examples you give are not necessarily about the victim. You know, you talk about Raskolnikov, and, uh, uh, and and Sonia, but Sonia wasn't a victim. Sonia was a witness, like, you know, priest is a, vic a witness in the sacrament. So it's not the actual, like in Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you have actually the wrongdoer and the victim facing each other, but in the sacrament of penance doesn't happen. So what I'm basically leading you to is to maybe think in the more specific terms, let's say we are dealing today in this crisis with, you know, yeah. political communities that you know are on this kind of one is on the side of the victim and another is on the side of, of the aggressor and uh, so how would we apply um, your um, political theology to this situation because what we see today is of course uh, many um, uh, well, lots of emotions and of course uh, uh, there is no any sign of <laughs> the wrongdoer, you know, admitting that they, they actually wrongdoers. Yeah. So that's that's the first right. <laughs> thing that they, yeah. that we see. But also there is no yeah. any um, sign that the other side is, is willing to forgive even on on certain conditions. So uh, so what wh where do we start and how do we actually yeah. move from the level of uh, uh, let's say. Um, you know, individuals into the level of political community and uh, yeah. how we apply this. Um, sorry. So there's a few things I would like to highlight. One is the idea of truth telling and, and thinking about communion. So it really did occur to me as I was writing this that uh, within sort of authoritarian totalitarian regimes, I mean, even to the point of not being able to trust, you know, your relatives, I mean, uh, and how that might be political dangerous. I mean, to live in a regime where you have to, um, I think the, the, the confession we talk about the sacramental way of political union, and I think the Eucharist has a way of helping us to understand that, but also the sacrament of confession, because we have this idea of the sacraments that you know Jesus said, you know, go do these things, you know, we're under our obligation to do them. And when the reality is, and I said, of course, historically inaccurate. I mean, when the, when the reality is, is that the church, you know, rightly sort of recognized certain acts and practices as sacramental in the sense as, you know, really facilitating the experience of God's presence, right? And I think truth telling is one of those. I really do. Um, and it really strikes me that, you know, political forms of uh, of political structures that really don't allow truth telling, right? And, you know, and one of the things that I, I think about in terms of that is, and this may be a bad example, I don't know, we can talk about it, but uh, a kind of truth telling where you're able to really um, speak against your political rulers and even, and even like mock them, right? Um, 
I, that to me is a sign of a, a, a good political structure. <laughs> uh, because you, truth telling is, is now expanded, right? And, um, you know, you, there's no fear. There's no fear of you know, going to jail because somehow you're going you're gonna, to you know, sort of speak against your political ruler or even mock them. Now, in terms of, so uh, again, so that's one point, the truth telling and thinking about the kinds of political structures that we really want, right? That's one point. When it comes to forgiveness, um, so I, str I struggle with this a little bit and I struggled with it when I was writing about it in the book. I, I really wanted to believe, um, so let me back up. When I, think about, when I think about forgiveness, like forgiveness between two people, I don't see it as an obligation, right? I don't see it as someone, you know, feeling like there's a rule that you have to forgive, doing the rule and feeling like you accomplished the rule. I also feel that forgiveness is kind of an event. Uh, it's an event that of something you sort of realize uh, it's a, you realize uh, you know, uh, that they have done something wrong. They, they, there's a certain kind of realization. And when those two come together, right, when the victim is in some kind of place where they are able to forgive, there are, you know, many reasons that that could happen. And when the victim, I'm sorry, the perpetrator is also in this place of asking for forgiveness, I, I find that one of the most remarkable experiences in uh, possible for, for human beings. I, I really do in the sense that um, it, it, it's, it's, it's one of those experiences where you see that uh, evil is not, uh, you see that evil is not definitive, right? Um, you see that there's a wrong that occurred that led to division between uh, human beings, and that somehow the particular uh, evil is not functioning in such a way that it's not uh, uh, continued to divide. But actually, now uh, people have come together, and it's not simply that this event has been forgotten, it's also the case that this event shapes how the relationship goes from here. So it kind of stays with them. And I, I find that uh, forgiveness uh, is really a, a, one of the greatest mysteries in the sense that it's, it's to me, it's the, the experience is itself the only thing that can point to how, in fact, evil doesn't have the final say, All right? So I think that experience is possible. I've heard stories about it, I've seen it. Now, in political forgiveness, we're talking about nations, we're talking about groups within a nation, we're talking about the Pope asking for forgiveness for the Crusades, you know, we're talking about things like that. I, I, think, I think political forgiveness should be driven for, like, I think people, we should strive for it. In other words, we should, they, I think, Tool. It's a personal encounter, there's personal conversation. With political communion, I think that has to be much more involved. There has to be, you know, you have to think about things like reparations, you have to think about symbolic structures, you have to think about perpetrators, perhaps, you know, for example, like in Germany, I mean, you have, you, you have, you know, uh, you have uh, um, Holocaust memorials, right, as real symbolic uh, acts, uh, symbolic significations of the wrongs that were done by, you know, the German people uh, during World War II. Um, it's, 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 it's just, it's more complicated. <laughs> it really is. I just think it's, political forgiveness is a lot more complicated. Um, I, I think we should continue to strive for it, you know, um, think about it, I just don't think it can lead quite to the same experience uh, that two people can have with each other. So I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not trying to um, discourage, um, especially you know, given what's happening within the Orthodox world to some extent. Um, there will be both, you know, need for one-to-one -one 
encounters of forgiveness, but there will be need for more symbolic institutional structures of, of uh, admittance of wrong and, and signs of forgiveness. Um, but again, I, I just think it's not the, quite the same. It's it's more it's much more complicated, I think. Um, and even even when the Pope apologized for the Crusades, right? It wasn't good good enough for some of the Orthodox, right? They, they just they still you know they still talk about it, you know. <laughs> they still um, they they still mention it. They still don't like the Pope. I mean, it's just you know. But he did it, you know. And I don't know. Maybe if he had some kind of memorial at the, you know, St. Peter's, maybe that would do more, but I, it might, it probably would, but yeah, so. Please, Father Andrew Louth uh, was the first. Uh, of course, the floor is yours. Telly, it's, uh, I've got one objection to what you're saying, and it's simply this, that, why do you always talk about others, other societies that you don't live in? Um, you know, German, Nazi Germany or uh, South Africa. What about, what about the societies that we live in? We both live, it seems to me, in totally dysfunctional democracies, not capable yeah. of producing leaders that we respect. Um, we, um, we, we are not beginning to cope with the way in which um, the social media make it impossible for, it make it very, very difficult to know what the truth is about almost anything because there, it is so easy to get confident opinions that seem to be based, seem to, seem to be able to justify themselves that are completely useless. Um, it seems to me that, 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 that the job of a theologian is, is not to, not, to, not the easy job, of criticizing obviously um, obviously corrupt regimes that we are not responsible for, but actually look at our own societies. Um, I mean, the, the trouble, the, oh, I've, I've, ever since you wrote your book, the trouble I feel with your book is that it, what you're trying to do is at one level, and, and you're, hang on, you're doing more than that, at one level, what you're trying to do is to open the eyes of the Orthodox and the values of democracy, fine. But at the same time, it's a very imperfect system. And, and a lot of the things that you are complaining about in other people's societies, for which you're not responsible, are actually true in a similar kind of way in the society that you, you belong to or that I belong to. I mean, there are dysfunctional democracies that have, that, 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 that I mean, look at, the, look at the way we're reacting to what's going on in Ukraine. We, our leaders are not capable I mean, our leader here is a man who has got no moral compass whatever um, and is capable of comparing the Ukraine's attempt to defend itself against Russia with um, Britain's joining, leaving the, the European Communion. This is complete, this is just, yeah. it is, actually it's blasphemous, it seems to me, to put those two in the same level. And it seems to me that, that, that if we're going to do political theology, we, we really ought to be directing our attention to, to, the, to the, 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 the political system under which we live and for which we are in some sense responsible, rather than um, um, blasting out against other people, often Nazi Germans a long time ago now. I mean, we, I, it's not a question of nobody's going to condemn what went in, East, in Nazi Germany. The sort of thing to say are oh, just the easy goals. The really difficult goal is to say something about the corruption of the society in which we live. And you. Yeah. So yeah, a couple of I think that yeah, those are I mean those are good observations, and um, I would say a couple of things. One is uh, first of all, when I wrote the book, the, the motivation for the book uh, itself was a couple of things. One is um, the kind of anti-liberal rhetoric that started coming from mostly theological discourses and even philosophical with people like Alistair McIntyre. And others. I don't know if Nelson Mucker was necessarily anti-liberal. I think he was just mainly pointing to kind of how liberalism itself was a historical construct. Um, so, so part of uh, the motivation of the book was uh, being, becoming part of that particular conversation, let's say people like Harawas and John Milbank and others. 
becoming part of that conversation, but also a, a worry, a worry of mine that given the, uh, and the ideas of the book really started, you know, in, in, you know, percolating, let's say in the late 1990s. So there was a worry of mine that in the post-communist situation that the, the countries that were under uh, uh, Orthodox uh, Christian, uh, they're identified as Orthodox Christian countries, let's say that were under communism, would appropriate this kind of anti-liberalism as a way of forging a particular kind of relationship to politics and society and culture that itself would uh, um, to a great to be, be anti-democratic. And quite, quite honestly, I, I don't really think I was wrong about that because uh, we're kind of seeing that play out um, nowadays in, in, in many, many of the Orthodox countries. No, what about so second, I mean, that was, that, that was, that was the motivation, well, yeah, that was the motivation. Well, that was the motivation of the book. Um, second, I, I don't think it's 100% fair to say that I was not critical of my own country because I, there are parts in the book where I say that, you know, this, what's happening in the United States is not ideal. I do point to, however, um, maybe some positive aspects, but I don't think it's 100% fair to say that there's no criticism about what happens in the United States. Um, so there is some, I would say. And then I, say, I would say the third thing is, is that I think you're right. I mean, I, I, so, I mean, I think there are various conversations going on. I don't think it was misplaced to um, worry about how a particular conversation in the West might actually unfold within uh, Orthodox countries that were once under communism. I so I don't necessarily think it was misplaced to have an eye on that um, and to kind of think about it and to basically make the claim that the Orthodox really haven't theologically dealt with you know, these issues of democracy. So let me give it a try uh, as a way of creating a conversation. So I don't think that that was necessarily uh, misplaced um, in terms of doing that. I will say though, that I think you are right that the conversation now does have to turn toward um, the dysfunctional, uh, the, the way in which democracies have, um, have become somewhat dysfunctional within Western societies. I, I agree with that. Um, and I think maybe that that's that should be part of the conversation. I mean, I don't think quite honestly, I don't in 2000 when I, you know, when I wrote in the middle of and kind of eventually published this, I, I could not have anticipated the 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 way in which this functionally has unfolded, right. Um, but I don't I, I think again, I think you're right that um, criticism should also be kind of turned towards the Western countries and their misuse and their, um, I mean, a lot of people are talking too about the United States and their, you know, the, the, the havoc they've wrecked in the Middle East. And I think that's, that's, that's accurate. I mean, I, do, I think we should criticize those governments and what they've done, uh, those particular leaders and what they've done. So absolutely. I think it's, it's the height of hypocrisy somehow that somehow they haven't, um, you know, engage in their own self-criticism about these particular, about their particular actions, you know. And um, so, so I would say in answer to your question, yes and no. I mean, I, I don't think that when I wrote the book, it was misplaced to frame it in the way I did, right? So I think it still has that kind of value. Do I think that the conversation needs to go on and uh, involve sort of, now addressing the way democracy is in danger and the way in fact Christian groups and even churches and even the United States, I mean, uh, Orthodox are some of the most, you know, some of the Orthodox priests and clerics are some of the most polarizing figures here. I absolutely, I think we should do that. Um, so to some extent, I think it would make what I discussed in my book somewhat more relevant, um, but, but turning it towards, you know, places that I didn't think um, needed convincing, let's say, that uh, that democracy and liberal democracy is something that needs to be um, defended. So, yeah. Is the connection better? Yes, yes, yeah. it is better. Um, thank you so much, uh, Tele. And the next question of uh, Daniel Scarborough. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so you've already spoken to, to my question, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. And that is, uh, uh, can we um, really speak about democracy within the church? Um, or or is, there any, or is there any need for caution when, when speaking about that? And I ask because of my own research into the Russian church in 1917, when they were uh, reestablishing the Moscow Patriarchate. And uh, Bulgakov in particular, whom you, you reference in your book as, as someone who is an advocate of the church engaging the world through liberal democracy, which you know, I would agree with you there. Uh, he voiced, he was one of those who voiced uh, concern that parliamentary democracy would um, bleed into the church structure and uh, possibly overturn the, the authority, the canonical legitimacy of, of the church. And so this, this was a major, a major debate um, in the various councils in 1917 because of the conditions of animosity and anarchy. And, and what the, the <clears throat> solution I think was a kind of um, compromise where they, they would not talk about democracy in the church, they would talk about something more like the electoral principle, where the laity and the, the lower clergy had a voice, but they, they wanted to preserve the uh, apostolic authority of the episcopate in this process of reforming the church. And unfortunately, I think all of that progress has been lost in the Russian church today. But uh, so I, that's my question. I wonder if, if you think that there's any any need for concern uh, in, in discussing democratic processes and the ecclesiastical governance and, and uh, canonicity. Um, yeah, so I, I would say, um, I remember you know, thinking about this idea that the, the synodality is sort of akin to democratic structures from an old professor of my father, Theodos Theodianopoulos, because I remember <laughs> We were talking about this, and um, and and to some extent, if you really think about it, I mean, the synodal this the, the synodal system has certain democratic features to it, right? I mean, the, the bishops come. Through, there's representation. The bishops represent, and they come in and they vote, um, and so and they come vote on institutional matters. Um, I, and and I think that's why also too. I mean, when we when we think about you know dogmatic proclamations that we talk, we do talk about sort of. You know, it has to be received by the church. So that that has nothing to do with voting, right? That has something to do with, yeah, deliberations, declarations, and then kind of reception. But uh, I mean, let's be honest. When it comes to like, you know, who's going to pay the bills and should we buy that property and things like that, I mean, th those are voting matters, right? So it is quite fascinating that at least the synodal structure has something that looks kind of like um, a um, a synodal, a kind of democratic system. Um, I and th from that point on, I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm hesitant to kind of lay out sort of detailed structures, right? I, I don't think we should have a parliamentary system. I don't think we should have parties within the church. Um, I think it's more about representation, right? I do think that um, we we need to we need to we need to facilitate a kind of representation that mirrors the kind of communion we say is happening within the. Eucharistic assembly, and um, so I'll just I'll just leave it at that. And I, right now, I don't think we have those structures of representation. Thank you. Uh, then uh, we should uh, give uh, word to our uh, students. And first will be Yona, then Silver, if uh, and Crystal, if they uh, would like to ask, uh, and then uh, Natalia Vasilievich. Please, Yona. Thank you, and um, thank you for uh, the input so far, and also the materials reading with great interest. As it sort of reminds me of um, of my own own project. Uh, um, I was wondering. I mean, um, you, you, I, I'm changing my question. I brought an, an, another question in the forums, but but I I feel that the, what I asked has sort of been in a certain sense discussed. Although I was just wondering, how do you diagnose the, the sort of the state of the liberal democracy? Um, at the moment, I mean, there was, uh, there was the question of, of being it being dysfunctional. And, and there has been 
I mean, that sort of contrast, if, if you think of, of, of um, um, St. Augustine's uh, sort of that, that contrast between the city of, of men and, and city of God, and that sort of that uh, sort of antithesis or that tension between them. And if we think of nowadays, uh, the, 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 the state or the polis or uh, as something that sort of is, is ought to be tolerated uh, rather than something that is that can be discussed theologically, and I'm, I'm sort of struggling with that idea of political theology because I'm 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 thinking of I'm thinking rather of of ecclesiology in, in, in the in uh, and I'm thinking if what it, when we speak about the church we speak, speak of ecclesiology and not of political theology, and so I'm I'm having a hard time putting uh, together. Uh, uh, the the discourse of the of the police of the state of the politics and then the the church as the event of the Eucharist and I'm just just wondering that how do you sort of I mean uh, uh, how do you reconcile how do you sort of fit well, the them Orthodox, together yeah I mean, the Orthodox have a, like like there's many Orthodox who like to say that sort of um, the church has nothing to do with politics, we don't get involved in politics and so on and so forth. And um, I think that that's a mistake. I mean, even even silence is a political act, right? And um, I don't, there's nothing that doesn't really affect what we're calling political structures in the broader sense and political community. There's nothing that, I mean, there's nothing that's outside of it, uh, quite not, even Monathos. Right, it's technically under the, the the government of Greece, and to kind of say that Monothos is somehow removed from sort of political realities and political structures is just is wrong, historically inaccurate. And so, I just we need to realize that our spiritual life and our ecclesial life somehow uh, have have are related to uh, political structures and and to forms of community where we have to live with people that don't. <clears throat> agree with what we uh, agree with. So that would be one thing. And then the second thing would be, well, where do we find our inspiration and our vision for how we should be relating both as institution and as individual Christians to these, these political realities? So one option could be, um, uh, one, you know, one option could be that, you know, we want political structures where uh, there is a certain kind of uh, church state and Christian state relationship where the state absolutely uh, supports um, uh, one religion uh, as the only legal religion, uh, sometimes even has laws that, that facilitate that, that perhaps limit religious freedom and religious expression. So that, that, I mean, and we could we could theologically defend that by saying, well, we have the truth and therefore the king and the emperor or the president or whatever should support, uh, you know, the, the truth. I mean, should support this particular kind of um, uh, uh, you know, we should support us uh, politically and legally uh, because we are the truth and that's that's how it should go. Yeah, I guess what I'm arguing is that that's, that vision is maybe, there's, there can be some theological reasons put forward to defend a vision like that. I'd say with that vision is not the most theologically consistent vision with what we say about the incarnation, what the incarnation implies about the church and what the incarnation implies for what it means for us to be human. So I guess what I'm really saying is what the incarnation says about uh, us as uh, what the incarnation is, what it implies for what, what the church is, what it implies for us to be human, um, implies also a certain kind of political vision that we should strive for, right? And and that includes, I mean, you know, you know, we say within the West um, that we have these you know, democracies. That includes being prophetic within those spaces. There's never, there's never going to be a time when a Christian is not going to be prophetic. I mean, political structures will always fall short, right? Um, but we can say, we have to say, <laughs> we have to say that some forms of political community are, are better than others, are more theologically consistent than others with what we're saying about the incarnation. We have to, even within democracies, as we're moving towards more dysfunctional forms of democracies, we, we have to say that, that 
that where things are moving, let's say within our democracies, you know, in the UK with Boris Johnson, in the United States with Trump and the Trumpsters and all that, we, we have to say that this these particular movements are, yeah, are dangerous, are, but even before that, I mean, I think we can go back and say that we can go back and, and say that, you know, ways of thinking about economic justice in the 90s under Bill Clinton also were wrong, right? Um, you know, obviously what happened with George Bush and, and the sort of the Iraq war. I mean, that, so we, we have to be able to kind of continue to be on our prophetic guard, so to speak. But, you know, we have to, but I think we have to be careful of creating these kinds of diametric, these, these completely dualistic and diametrical oppositions in ways that um, I think are unhelpful. Uh, we, we have to, you know, we, have, we just simply have to say that some forms of political organization and community are just more theologically sound than others. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, next question, Silver Lloyd. Please, please. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your inspiring lecture and, and also reading. Actually, I have a first a question or rather a comment uh, on your work, uh, Mystical as Political. You, uh, you mention uh, uh, David Tracy, uh, who has claimed that uh, the Orthodox people have a certain advantage. They did not go through the well-known chain of events within the West, meaning the Reformation, <laughs> Counter-Reformation, Enlightenment, Romanticism, and so on. Uh, uh, for me as a historian, uh, there seems to be at least one exception in the case of um, uh, Orthodox, uh, Orthodox people in Ukraine or Ruthenia uh, in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, actually uh, very much connected to uh, Renaissance, Reformation, Humanism. So uh, it seems a bit uh, like an oversimplification for me. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm happy to very... be, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to be corrected on that point. I mean, I think, um, and even within Russia in the 19th century, at least, but within Russia in the 19th century, I mean, there is a certain sense in which um, the Russian thinkers sort of start engaging those particular texts, um, not as a form of continuity, let's say, the, as it might have happened within sort of Protestant and Catholic thinkers, right? I mean, they were they were engaging these this sort of trajectory from the get from the beginning. Um, the Orthodox didn't quite, you know, quite honestly, didn't really have the luxury uh, for that. And they didn't have the institutions yet to do them. Um, but I do think that uh, I do think in the 19th century, uh, I mean, it's often another kind of uh, uh, caricature that Orthodoxy never confronted modernity. I mean, that's obviously inaccurate. Um, um, so yeah, so I, I think that that I think that does have to be somewhat nuanced in a way. I, I do. Um, there's a kind of truth to it, but I think it needs a little more nuancing. So, but that would be a great article uh, in our Journal of Orthodox Christian Studies to kind of bring out how, in fact, Orthodox thinkers, intellectuals, peoples were in fact uh, dealing uh, with those sources uh, during that time because I don't think that's widely known. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Crystal, uh, please. Yeah, hello. hello. I, I put a question, um, yeah, which is actually already answered, um, at least partly. And my concern was, um, well, I belong also to these people who say that I would not put together theology and politics and um, yeah, you said some words about it already that many people do. And uh, well, this is also my concern. Um, this uh, um, was one question, one question and another which was, uh, was raised here during your um, or during this discussion was, um, um, yes, uh, we have, uh, we, we should say that some societies are better um, to the churches or where the church can live better. But um, I ho also have this um, opinion that we 
um, some some things in um, these societies don't do not go well. For example, um, yeah, the deep of belief. The belief is not only is not going to be deeper in very democratic societies. So i um, or put it very shortly, we are not doing better when we are um, not whether yeah in terms of Christianity or belief, we are not always doing better if the surrounding is too open, too democratic, and so on. Thank you. I think what I hear you saying is that religion should have some uh, public role in shaping sort of, um, uh, you know, ways in which um, uh, particular laws are enacted, the way in which people think about certain ideas. Um, and, and, and I don't agree with, I mean, I don't disagree with that. I agree with that because one of the ways of thinking about liberal forms of democracy is to marginalize religion and to privatize it. And I think that's one of the debates that's really happening right now, to what extent, at least within the West United States, to what extent should a religion be privatized? And you have different forms of privatization from France to Norway, to the UK, to the United States. I mean, when I talk to students about the United States and is, 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 is America, is the United States secular? They say no, uh, because they see how what role religion plays, what role it's played recently in the elections, what role it's played in this insurrection on January 6th. Um, but so, I mean, I, I, I think one of the, we're still kind of, you know, uh, so again, one of the inspirations for my book was this kind of political, this debate that was in political philosophy first about religion's role within um, liberal democracies, which was in many ways defined by someone like John Rawls. Um, that sort of seeped into sort of theological criticisms of liberalism as well, and to what extent the church should support liberal democracies, et cetera, right? And part of one of the key features of that debate is, uh, you know, to what extent should religion, you know, play a role within, you know, liberal forms of democracy? I still think we're in the midst of that debate. And to some extent, I think uh, even, you know, again, what we're seeing sort of uh, in, in what kind, the kind of, um, Fusion we're seeing in Russia today, uh, the different the different way it's happening in Greece. I mean, the different way it's happening in France. The you know, um, United States, etc. I mean, I, part of what we're seeing is this uh, ongoing debate of the role of of religion, and um, yeah. So I, I, that's also should be part of the theological reflection. There, there are just better and were theologically more consistent or inconsistent ways in which the institutional church and Christians should, should be um, operating. And so as an example, I mean, it's like coming back to the United States, I mean, I think the United States, um, there are, you know, these Christian nationalists now that have emerged publicly, I think they've always been there, but have emerged publicly. And, you know, they, they I think they want to see uh, the United States sort of um, uh, legally, let's say, reflect, um, you know, reflect um, um, uh, sort of Christian values, right? And so that becomes sort of the issue. Like, I mean, you know, uh, well, let me be more specific. In the United States, you have this, you know, debate about to what extent people who own certain businesses can I mean, at, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we had this debate about gay marriage. I mean, now we have this debate about whether, you know, people can bake cakes for gay weddings. And um, so there you have issues of, you know, what role religion plays, religious freedom, et cetera. And this is exactly the point where I think the church as an institution and Christians have to say, okay, I'm not in the church. I'm in a political community with people who are different than me, right? What, what should I be fighting for? You know, what should I be fighting for here? Right? And that's where I think there's a, there's, it's difficult because in one sense, there's this idea that morality is universal and that somehow I need to transfer it to the political community in all senses. And I, and I, and I think that's where, that's the hard part, 
right? When you kind of move into this space that not everybody believes in Jesus Christ the way you do, then, then how exactly do you, what are you fighting for? What should for you fight for? What should the church fight for? And often there's this confusion that the church should actually impose its morality on the broader political community. And I guess what I'm arguing is that that's not necessarily the case. And that shouldn't, shouldn't necessarily be the case. Now, it should be thinking about structuring, you know, political community in particular kinds of ways. So, Thank you so much, uh, Tele. And the uh, next question, Natalia Vasilevich. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask something different, but now uh, while Taylor was answering the last uh, question, I decided to uh, refer uh, to this answer. Um, and how can we define uh, uh, these two different these two different modalities of uh, church promoting certain uh, values, certain uh, ideas um, in the wider political community uh, between uh, what church should witness and uh, uh, what it uh, imposes on the wider political community. How we know if uh, the, um, uh, something is um, necessary uh, to be uh, witnessed. For example, if we take this uh, uh, conscience objection, because this uh, cake uh, bakers, uh, they refer to conscious objection uh, for uh, as a premise uh, to refuse uh, to bake uh, a cake on the basis of their religious and moral convictions. But if we take, uh, for example, um, uh, like typical uh, uh, army, uh, like how should we somehow uh, promote the certain um, uh, the certain model of army? Uh, do we have uh, or do we how how do we do our work of peace and justice in the society? Uh, not touching this kind of uh, uh, issues. If there should be like a professional army or uh, aggressive uh, army which can intervene in the uh, uh, certain situations uh, outside the country and so on, and um, should so uh, like in in some sense uh, we we have some responsibility as a church uh, to promote certain ideas and certain values but how uh, this obligation corresponds to uh, um, uh, autonomy certain autonomy of uh, uh, political community from us uh, which we should not uh, uh, intervene uh, and impose uh, some ideas and values like uh, um, you propose on the bake cakes uh, yeah gate. I, yeah yeah I mean I, I don't first of all you have to convince the church you have to convince Christians in the church somehow which is part of what my book is trying to do you have to actually convince them that that what they should be sort of aiming for within political communities is not exactly the same as what you expect within the ecclesial community. So that's that's a difficult, that's a difficult kind of uh, thing for people to live into, right? And they feel somehow they're they're um, defying their faith. They, they they feel like somehow they're you know um, they're not being true to their faith. But in fact, I'm trying to say they're actually being true to their faith in the sense that they're realizing that this political community requires a different kind of discernment and participation, quite honestly. So that, that's the hard part. Uh, and then when that can happen, um, and, and look, the sad reality is if the institutional churches had their way, they would actually absolutely use the government to impose things that are manifestly anti-democratic. The only thing keeping Greece, uh, the Church of Greece from doing that is the European Union, quite honestly. And, and, and the different kinds of political debates within Greece. But if the Church of Greece had its way, it would absolutely impose um, what it wants on society. And that's, that's, the, that's, that's the greatest temptation of all the institutional churches. They just, they see a, a friendly government and they're like, okay, well, I'm just gonna maximize this now. And rather than actually thinking about like, well, what, what is my role here? <laughs> what really is, what is our role, right? And um, <clears throat> so that's the hardest part. 
Um, and then in terms of like a mechanism whereby the church then decides, you know, I mean, if the church can just kind of make, figure out for itself that in the end, what it really should be supporting is democratic structures that ultimately uh, facilitate things like freedom and equality. You know, those are very amorphous, generalized claims, right? And those can take on various, you know, various kinds of structures. There's no one size fits all, right? There's no one size fits all. But at that point, that's where the synodal structures come in, where the church needs to have uh, certain kinds of discussions and representations in order to kind of figure out how it should respond. So again, the religious freedom issue, for example. So this is very, this happened, it happened very, very quickly. I mean, it, you know, within the United States, the gay marriage issue happened like really fast, actually. It surprised everybody, quite honestly, even politicians like Barack Obama. Uh, but it did happen. And then we kind of migrated to this idea of can we, you know, can we bake cakes, uh, you know, for gay marriages and things like that. And I, I, you know, most of the institutional structures within the Orthodox churches in America were, you know, basically in favor of the religious freedom of the person to deny a gay couple baking a cake, right? I don't personally think that was the right, that's, I don't personally think that's the right decision. Uh, and it's not personal, I, I would give theological reasons for that. But one of the things that the church doesn't realize is how manifestly hypocritical it is, right? There are, there are Orthodox churches that open up their church halls, church halls to weddings of other religious traditions, right? Which they don't even recognize as valid. And yet their church halls are open to Hindu weddings, you know, Muslim weddings, Catholic weddings. So they're not being consistent in any way. Right, but then all of a sudden, a gay couple wants a cake, and a Christian says, "No, I don't want to bake one for you." I, they said, "This is just ridiculous, in my opinion." Quite honestly, I don't mean to kind of minimize conscientious objection, right? But the bottom line is that the church has to have an independent voice. Democratic structures facilitate that independent voice, and then it's up to the church to figure out responsibly how to use it, and theologically in a way that's responsible. And quite honestly, I mean, at least what's happening in Russia, I mean, they, they fought so hard to have kind of political and cultural relevance that they've absolutely completely lost their independent voice. Absolutely. Zero, zero independence there. And I hope that the rest of the Orthodox world takes notice, quite honestly. At the very least in Greece, what you have is an independent voice. I mean, I'd agree with everything they say, but at least at, at the very least within the Church of Greece, you have an independent voice. And I think somewhat to the extent in Romania too. So, but uh, you know, I there's no there's no manual, Natalia. I think that you know you have to first convince the churches that this is how they should act. That's the hardest part. Then once you convince them of that, then you know then you have to think about the kinds of structures that would facilitate facilitate discussions and conversations around these various kinds of issues. I think so. Thank you. Um, I, I, I see uh, Jonas' hand, but uh, unfortunately, it's time to end uh, our seminar. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I have another meeting. I'm sorry. Yes. And I have to. I have to get ready for it. So I have one at eleven o'clock. So, and, but and, uh, and we, maybe we can come back and continue at some point. But I was very grateful for this opportunity. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. I hope that some. I hope that doesn't. Uh, uh, obfuscate um, what I said in those areas. So, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I would just uh, also thank on my part, uh, tell you, and I can see that uh, there were certain uh, notions that were quite novel for, for, for people here. And I guess, you know, we need time to uh, digest and we will try to have another meeting with you at some point so thank sure you so i'm much. happy to continue this yeah happy to continue this yeah. yeah well great so we say goodbye and thank you everybody thank you. for participating and uh Andre thank you. For, thanks kelly for... thank you andre thank you everybody thank you paul good to see you so, so, so have, have a bye good bye week, everybody. everybody thank you very much uh, yeah. thank bye. you thank you thank you